Welcome to the One God Report. And today we have a special guest with us. Actually, he's been with us from the beginning. His name is Preston Macy, and we thought it would be a good idea to have him share his testimony. Steph and I have already given our testimonies on a number of occasions. We'll put a link in the show notes. I think it would be good that Preston tells us how he came to know the Lord. Preston, if you would, go ahead and yeah. start in. Well, thank you. I've shared this before, and it really is pretty much a three-part testimony. So the first one is how I gave my life to living out what Jesus said, believing that the God of the Bible is the, God, is the one true God, which isn't totally true because I used to believe in the Trinity, but basically that the Bible was the truth, I guess I could say. Uh, and then trying to follow with those teachings. And then the next part of it would be coming to a deeper understanding of the truth, which would be how I got out of believing the Trinity and into really seeing the Bible for what it said, allowed the Bible to kind of speak for itself on the one true God aspect. And then the third part is going through the different beliefs, and I'll kind of elaborate more as I uh, give my testimony, but going deeper into what I really believed about certain things, such as the kingdom of God, the sleep of the dead, things like that. Um, so in my, in my journey to find God, I have memories growing up. We went to church, not all the time, but I grew up in the Northeast. And culturally, you went to church on Christmas and then on Easter, and then maybe a few times during the year. What state did you live in? In Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, I can't remember... It was either an Episcopalian or a Presbyterian church that we would go to on those occasions. And then throughout the year, we'd go maybe a handful of times. The one thing I can remember now is I would just, I'd be very bored with the whole process. But I remember reading, picking up the Bible because I was just kind of bored. I didn't know why we were there, right? We didn't really, it wasn't a big emphasis in the home of reading the Bible. Although my mom did read me biblical stories growing up. So I knew about Noah. I knew about Abraham. We read some stories about David and Goliath, and I did go to Sunday school for a little bit. So I had this kind of like foundation of that there was a Bible out there that talked about God, but details, I didn't know anything. I didn't really know what it was to be a Christian or anything like that. In college, the first friends I met were Christians, and this was, God set this whole thing up. Mm -hmm. What school is that? That was University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So when I was uh, 18 years old, I showed up. And there was this big event, it was a tennis event, uh, right after kind of the whole period where you get your books and you get your schedules and everything, you get some things figured out. And I was a tennis player in high school, so I decided to go. Well, it was put on by one of the campus churches, which was an Assemblies of God church. And there were some great people there, and we came, became fast friends, and I started to go to their church. I go, went to their Bible studies, and it was the first group of people that we would really read the Bible together. I mean, it was, it was a biblically focused group. And, uh, that's when I just discovered that I, uh, began to have to, to pray to God more, begin to see how God is real. And then I gave my life to Christ. I got baptized there and I stayed in that basically campus group for the rest of my time at Michigan. Mm -hmm. I don't want to interrupt you too much there, Mm -hmm. but did you have the idea of the Trinity when you say you gave your life life to Christ? Yes. Huh? So my idea of God was a three part God. Hmm. It was even then. Even then, mm-hmm. it was Father, Son, Spirit. Mm-hmm. I got uh, I got really into it actually. I I did do some research because I wanted to see if I could see that the Bible didn't teach it. That was a thing. I I couldn't explain it. Everybody who it wasn't taught in detail at all. Right when it was brought up, it was. And God's a Father, Son, and Spirit, and the three are one. But there wasn't any sort of in-depth teaching. Some I, I do. There was a pastor there, and he did go into <clears throat> a little bit of depth one time. But it did end up in him saying it's just a mystery, mm-hmm. and we can't really understand it. And I trusted that, and I that's what everybody else was saying as well. So I said, okay, that's mm-hmm. that's what it is. Mm-hmm. But it was always a little bit of an itch that I, I had a continuous scratch to it. One mm-hmm. of these things. So I did research online at the time. I was able to kind of go on to YouTube and other video sites. I would look at uh, lectures by people like Ravi Zacharias. There's another one, Mark Driscoll, who's out in Seattle for a while. And they would give in-depth teachings on the Trinity. Hmm. 
and they sounded legit. I mean, they were they spoke with confidence. They did use a couple of verses. Everybody else was respecting them, uh, and they they would go on these speaking tours. And to me, that's just what everybody believed. Mm-hmm. So I believed it. And of course, then I started teaching it, hmm. and I used the same language that they did. Mm-hmm. Um, that Jesus came to Earth as God. He was born. Uh, he died as God. He was raised. And somehow this made sense at the time, right? Oh, wow, so, they actually said God died? I believe they did, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think they're supposed to, but that's all right. Keep and I think down. that's what I said, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's what I would just believe. Because yeah. it was difficult to recon, reconcile. Mm-hmm. You know, how how is he God? But then he was God-man. Mm-hmm. And then he died. So I guess I didn't really think about it too much. Because, yeah. of course, when you start thinking about it, that's when the problems really occur. Mm-hmm. Now, what did you study at the University of Michigan? So I was an engineer. So I was aerospace engineering. Mm-hmm. And which I think later when I really did start to dig into this, it helped me out. Because it was, in engineering, everything has a cause. Everything has like a, this happens because of this. Or you can explain this because of this original concept kind of thing. In airplanes, you know, how is lift produced? That was actually one of the mysteries. I, I, I graduated with this degree and I still didn't know how airplanes really flew. And so afterwards, I had to research this stuff. And, and that's when I realized that it's good to go into details, you know, and things can be explained. And when you understand it, you have a lot more peace about what you're actually talking about. Mm-hmm. So after college, I went to the Navy and I traveled. I went to Pensacola, Florida for about six months, then I went to Oklahoma. And this is part of the flight training that I was in. And it was interesting because I went to everywhere I went, I sought out a different church and it was different from the group that I was in. In Michigan. In Michigan, it was Assemblies of God. And then for the most part in the South, it was basically Baptist-based of one degree or the other. And I noticed for the first time that not all Christians believe the same thing. Some people emphasized things more than others. Some people were more charismatic than others. There was a lot of variation, and it caused me to kind of go into the Word more and say, okay, well, what's the Bible say? Is everybody correct? Is one more correct than the other? And when I went to my final training base, which was in Virginia, that's when I was, uh, I was always searching for more and more truth because there were, I, I realized that there were things in my believing, one of which was the Trinity, that I didn't really understand. And I couldn't see it in the Word. And it was something that I was constantly researching. If you asked me at the time, I would have told you, yes, I believe in the Trinity. I believe that Jesus is God. But I found myself always looking for different ways of explaining it. Hmm. And I think subconsciously I knew that there was something wrong because I do remember grappling with this thing as far as, let me see if there's another lecture that talks about this. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's another way that this is explained. Maybe there's some other verses that I'm not really reading. And when I ran into a group of Christians in Virginia, they brought up the first time the concept that the Trinity may not be real. Mm -hmm. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because this was my foundation of faith. This is who God was for me. I prayed to the Trinity. I remember splitting up my prayers. That's it's, rare. When I hear people pray now, even the most Trinitarian of Trinitarians, they'll pray mm-hmm. to the Father. Well, it was confusion. I would pray. I didn't really know who to pray to, right? For, for the most part, it was to the Father. Mm-hmm. But I remember splitting up my prayers into, well, I should. I don't want to leave Jesus out. I don't want to leave the Holy Spirit out. You know, maybe I pray for more like miraculous things to God the Father, maybe for more understanding to the Holy Spirit. Like, how do I divide this stuff? The Bible's not clear on this. It was just a lot of confusion. Mm-hmm. So when I ran into this group, they they were Unitarians. And, what kind? Uh, Universalist Unitarians? Biblical Unitarians. Uh-huh, okay. So they believed in the, in the Father was God alone, and that Jesus was a man who didn't exist until God conceived and married, or mm-hmm. put... Uh, seed and Mary. So they believe the scriptures, not like universalist Unitarians. Correct. Which kind of is, you can believe whatever you want and everybody's going to be okay. But these are biblical Unitarians. And that's a good distinction. I didn't know what a Unitarian Universalist was until actually maybe a year or two years ago. But when you throw out the word Unitarian, that's what most people actually Mm -hmm. think of. So these are people who believe that the word of God was the truth, that the Father was God, that Jesus was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard that the Trinity, that they didn't believe in the Trinity, my first thought was, well, obviously they haven't read the Bible. Hmm. So I went on this quest to prove them wrong. Not really to prove them wrong, but just to show them in the Bible that God is this three-part being. And that's why I really started to look at verses critically. 
And I was talked out of the Trinity by reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately why I became a biblical Unitarian. Oh, yeah, I know the feeling. Exactly. Any verse in particular you think of? The ones that really struck out at me were the ones that, that uh, clearly said that Jesus had a God. Hmm. Because for whatever reason, in all my readings in the Old Testament, there's one thing that I knew is that God was God alone. And that there's nobody else above him. Hmm. And that there's no other God beside him. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, when I read the Old Testament, I would read that in such a way that somehow it made sense with the Trinity. I can't put it together now, but at the time, I just maybe glazed over it or didn't really think about it. Or that people in the Old Testament didn't have the total picture, the total revelation. Exactly. And that later on, the Lord made himself known more fully. That kind of an explanation. So I justified it somehow in mm -hmm. my mind. How about the New Testament verse? Can you give an example of... Yeah, what? absolutely. The ones that really caught me were Ephesians 1.3. Right, Ephesians 1.3, where it says, Blessed be the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that verse is repeated in 2 Corinthians 1.3. Where again it says, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, then I was thinking, well, maybe Paul had this idea, but maybe that was just him. Other people surely are more clear on it. And then you read 1 Peter 1.3. It's funny how these are all 1.3 verses. Mm. But it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Clearly all the first century apostles and disciples believed that Jesus had a Father and he had a God. Mm. And there's no way of looking at these verses other than by clearly seeing that Jesus had a God. Mm -hmm. And it just, I could not reconcile that with the Old Testament where I knew, like in Isaiah, God says it several times, there's no God besides me. There's no God besides there's me. There's only one. There's yeah. only one God. So if Jesus has a God. It nullifies these verses. You can't, that well, are very he can't clear. be God, yeah. 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 No. And so then it became a quest of, uh, I allowed myself to start to detach from my belief in the Trinity. And I became into kind of like this, like a limbo zone, where I, I didn't quite really know what to believe. And that's when I basically just poured myself into the Bible. And, and I just came to the conclusion, whatever the Bible was very clear on, that's what I was going to believe. Because I could actually stand behind verses. But you can't really stand behind creeds, right? Who's writing these creeds? Mm. Or tradition, because mm -hmm. that could change. But the Bible I could stand behind. Hmm. And it took me probably three years before I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus was not God. Mm -hmm. And at this time you were in Virginia. And you haven't said this yet, but I'll say it. Mm -hmm. You were uh, training to be a pilot. Correct. Eventually I'll say Preston is an F-18 pilot. right? He doesn't like to say it, but I've got to say that. I was training for F-18s yes. at the time in Virginia. And uh, this was right before I graduated being qualified in the F-18, and then I went to Japan. And so I came to this truth right before I went to Japan, mm -hmm. which was a good and a bad thing. It was a good thing because it allowed me to really study this on my own. For a while in Japan, I went on three and a half deployments of six months at a time. There's not a lot of things to do on the Navy ship. Of mm -hmm. course, you're, you're flying. Aircraft carrier. Yeah. Exactly, aircraft mm -hmm. carrier. But you have a lot of time to read and study, and that's exactly what I did. And... Uh, it just became more and more clear to me that this is what the Bible said. And then I re-listened to some of those lectures that I used to listen to. I re-listened to, to people like Ravi Zacharias, um, some of the other guys who I can't remember exactly. And w when you listen to what they're saying, they have a lot of rhetoric, but not a lot of substance. Hmm. And I could begin to see that their words, though they sounded like they had a lot of substance... It's not like reading it out of the Bible. Mm. It's not like seeing there was no verse that they could ever quote saying Jesus is God. Yeah. There's no verse that, about the Trinity that mm. they could quote. And then I started to see some of the ways where the, the Trinitarians in the past tried to put verses in there. One example, mm. which now, of course, adds to their detriment. Mm -hmm. So 1 John 5, 7, mm -hmm. which we know, was added to the Bible and only in the King James Version. And this started to smell of an yeah, agenda. It was, it was actually in an a earlier Greek version, right? right? With, just before the Reformation, this guy by the name of Erasmus. Erasmus is fourth putting, edition. Right, yeah. putting a Greek, uh, Greek New Testament together. Mm -hmm. He originally didn't put it in, but the Catholic Church forced him to put it in. Right. So now you see that there's an agenda behind the belief of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. It's not a biblical belief. You can't, you, can't really, you can't defend it in the Bible. 
mm-hmm. you know? So, and you see that more clearly when you do look into it. Yeah. Well, some people it. would say you, you can, right? You would take a verse here and a verse there and kind of combine them. You'd have a hint there and a hint there. Mm-hmm. But I think what you're saying, there's no place you can go to in the scriptures that says, now look, God is three persons in one essence or one being. Or exactly. Like Even the book of John. Right? There's the nothing in the book of John that says, now, by the way, God is three persons in one yeah, substance. The, the language yeah. they use in these yeah. creeds can't mm-hmm. be found in the Bible, yeah. is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Okay, keep us going. Now you're in Japan on aircraft carriers. Yeah, and now I'm fully convinced that this is who God is. It, it totally changes my thinking about who God is. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily change the way I relate to him. I still see him as my father, as my provider. I still trust in him and... His word still is a blessing in my life and enlightens me and everything. Well, let me ask you this. Did you feel that certain things in the scriptures became clearer? I began to see that the things that I was taught, it may be, there may be more to it than that. There may be, uh, it, it may have gotten washed down by some tradition or by some belief system of some sort. And I guess I'll give some examples of that right now. Mm-hmm. So when I was originally, when I was, you know, 19 to about 22, when I became a Christian and started to really kind of study this stuff, it was a very mainstream belief system. It was a belief system that the Trinity, of course, that when you died, you went to heaven, that there was hell, which was eternal conscious torment, and that basically all, eternity would be living in heaven with Jesus, mm-hmm. in God, of course, you know. Well, those beliefs started I would question those beliefs as well. As well, mm-hmm. so it wasn't the scripture you're questioning; it's the theological, exactly. Let's say interpretations. And it's basically going to the scripture just mm-hmm. to see can the can these be backed by scripture? Yes. Are there mm-hmm. not just one verse or two verses, but the overwhelming evidence in the Bible? Would you get this belief system from the overwhelming evidence in the Bible? Mm-hmm. With the Trinity, there was a couple of verses I really got hung up on, which kind of lingered my belief in the Trinity for. I didn't believe in it, but I just had trouble with these verses. One was Colossians 1.18, mm-hmm. where it says that all things were made through Christ or by Christ. But when you look at that closer, Paul's very specific in what he's talking about. Rulers, authorities, things of basically governmental structures and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I realized all these little verses that I got hung up on, when you put it into the context of what he's talking about, he's not talking about a trinity. He's talking about a very it, mostly a specific subject, which I'm sure that we'll get into some of these in more podcasts. Mm. The sleep of the dead was a big thing. You know, when you, de- when you die, what, what does the Bible teach when you die? I was just reading in Psalm 13. It says, uh, David says, Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, light my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Mm-hmm. And there's other things in the book of Kings and Chronicles. The king would die and he says, and then he was buried and he slept with his fathers. Mm-hmm. And Paul uses the metaphor of sleep exactly. the dead. And so does Jesus. And so does right. Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's never a spot where ever talks about somebody dying and then being in heaven. There's a few rare cases of people like uh, Elijah and um, Enoch. And Enoch. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we have two cases of these very godly men who had these kind of extraneous circumstances when they died. And the book of Hebrews says that Enoch includes him and those who died. Exactly. When Enoch was taken, he wasn't, you know, says the Lord took Mm -hmm. him. It doesn't say that he was dead or anything like that. We don't know what happened, but you're in Hebrews, it says all these died. In faith, right? In faith, Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was another one. So if your hope is not to go to heaven, what did you understand your hope to be? The way that I understood how things would play out. So once you died, you would sleep, and then Christ would return. And then those, like in the end of 1 Thessalonians 4, it talks about those who are dead in Christ will rise first, and those of us who will who are alive will put on immortality and we will meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. And I was taught that we would then go to heaven once Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. So he comes back in the clouds. All who are in Christ, either dead or alive at that time, would meet him in the air. And then we would all go up to heaven together and then somehow rule in heaven. And that part was very vague to me. Hmm. And it wasn't until a few teachings about the kingdom which I first heard about about a year and a half ago. Hmm. This totally brought the whole Bible together for me. Because this was, I could finally be very clear on what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation. And it's that 
the place of, of man is the earth. God made the earth for man. Hmm. He formed the earth. Out of the earth, he made man. And then man's the ruler of the earth. Hmm. And when you look at that verse at the end of 1 Thessalonians, it says that we will forever be with the Lord, Jesus. But then you have to ask the question, well, where's the Lord going to be? It's vague on that. Hmm. Then you go to the end of Revelation. Jesus is on earth. He's in his kingdom on earth. Mm -hmm. God promises to him to be the king of a people who are on earth. He promises Abraham that his, he will have you know, many descendants, not in heaven, but on earth. Mm -hmm. He promised him a land. Mm -hmm. Albeit a renewed earth in exactly. which righteousness dwells. Exactly. As the book of Hebrews says, yeah. And of course, in the next age, things will be restored as God originally wanted them. But we will be here on earth. Mm -hmm. We'll have to talk about this idea more on another podcast. Mm -hmm. So I basically categorize my, uh, my testimony in three parts. The first one is believing God and believing that Jesus... His sacrifice was enough for me to get forgiveness for my sins and to then go out and live life with him as my Lord and being a Christian. That was, and I got baptized. I actually got rebaptized. baptized We'll talk about that in a sec. But, uh, so that's when I first came to know who God was, who Jesus was. The second time I came to know who God was and Jesus was, was when I discovered that the Trinity was not a, was not taught in the Bible, but was a construct of the of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and I had to unlearn a lot of the things I learned. But then it allowed me to pour myself back into the Bible and really take a clean look at the Bible. Okay, God, who are you? Who's who's your son? And then the third big pillar of truth that I learned throughout those years was about the kingdom, mm -hmm. and how that really kind of sealed the whole Bible and made everything really come together. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Maybe I could ask a couple other questions. Yeah. So now where are you? Are you still in the Navy? or now You flew you flew F-18s on and off aircraft carriers. So I flew F-18s. Uh, last time I flew an F-18 was about f six years ago, back in 2013. And then I became a flight instructor down in Texas for four years. I got out of the Navy about two years ago in 2017. And I still do flight instruction down in Pensacola, Florida, which is one of the Navy flight instruction bases. Mm -hmm. And uh, where this uh, incident just was not long ago. There's an incident yeah. down there, yeah, mm -hmm. with one of the students. Yeah. And but now I live, of course, in Tennessee and go down there just periodically to train. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me ask if you could say one thing to somebody who believes that God is a Trinity. What would you say? Let's say you have two minutes. Well, the first thing I'd say is the Trinity was never taught to me out of the Bible. It was only taught to me out of this is who God is. And so I think by the time I actually started reading the Bible critically for myself, I already had an idea of what the Bible had said. But I never allowed the Bible to speak for itself. So I never came to the Bible with a clean slate. It was always, oh, this is what the Bible says, and now I'm going to prove what I think the Bible says in the pages of the Bible. So I think what I would say to a someone who believes in the Trinity and who really wants to find out who God is, and I, I understand it's a kind of a scary process. I went through it. And it's not like I never wanted to not believe in the Trinity. I All I wanted to do was believe what the Bible said. And what I found is the Bible very clearly teaches that there's one God, the Father, who they called Yahweh or Jehovah in the mm -hmm. Old Testament. And he has a human Messiah. And it's when you see that, it really opens up. You can see how Jesus is related to Adam. Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus is really the second Moses. Moses talks about another prophet coming after him. And how there's all these kind of uh, these ways that shadowed who Jesus would be in the Old Testament. And they were all humans who kind of represented a little bit of who Christ was. And... Christ being the second Adam, you know, the first Adam gets us into this mess. The second Adam gets us out of this mess of sin. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so God works through men. So I would say to somebody who believes in the Trinity, who is hearing this and thinking there's no way that, you know, the Trinity is false. Just look at the Bible with an open mind. What, what does the Bible say? Overwhelmingly, what, what do the words say? on the Bible say. Mm -hmm. And it, it'll take some time. I mean, it took me probably two years to really go through all the verses that I said, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And uh, it's true that some verses are more difficult than others. 
But if you go to the verses that are very clear, where Jesus has a God, Jesus died, Jesus was given all of his authority from God. At the end, Jesus will give all of everything he has back to God, like in 1 Corinthians 15. That's never said of the Father. And, and it's always made clear that God has his authority because he's God. Nobody gave him authority. So the fact that Jesus is being given authority, gives, it to, you know, gives everything back to God who gave it to him in the first place, these aren't really qualities of God. Mm-hmm. So I would just say maybe look at it and uh, look at the Bible and as best you can just try not to inject what you think into the pages of the Bible, mm-hmm. which is a difficult thing to do, I understand. Mm-hmm. And what would you say to a biblical Unitarian? Or I don't really like the phrase or the title personally. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what a Unitarian really is. It's Latin. And I think I'd prefer to define myself with biblical terms. But what would you say to a person who believes in one God, the Father, Mm -hmm. and the human Messiah, Jesus, who was put to death and whom God raised from the dead? Any piece of advice you'd like to give them? Well, I would say that you carry a truth with you that I think a lot of people would appreciate hearing about. I know that I always wanted to believe what the Bible said. I was just taught about the Trinity. Everybody who I was around believed in the Trinity. And not that you you go around and you just fire off, you know, this truth to people, because it's going to be a little bit, it can be disturbing to people to hear this. I mean, when you believe something for so long and then you, your entire worldview of, kind of who God is or your way of thinking of who God is completely changed. So your social life, exactly right, the circles you go in. And it's yeah. a lot of that's connected yeah. like that. So, you know, but we do have a responsibility to share this truth. But of course, we also have a responsibility to love people, to get to have them get to know who you are, to get to know them. And it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to share this with people. It's a wonderful thing to say clearly who God is. Because that was one thing that I can remember. I struggle with the confusion of it all. And I have a lot more peace about my relationship with God and when I read the Bible and understanding things because it's made clear. So you're doing people a favor by sharing this truth. But, of course, we do have to be sometimes gentle. Woman at the well kind of thing. Jesus didn't all of a sudden tell her that he's the Messiah. He brought her along. And and she has some questions along the way. So I would just encourage them to uh, want to share this with people, but also... Understand that people are at different spots. Maybe you'll just share a little bit of truth, but that's going to be what they need for down the road to come to the full understanding. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Preston. Thank and you. Yeah, it's, it's been great for us to get to know you as well. And Likewise. Yeah, yeah. It's a neat experience as well to be able to now look into the scriptures, God willing, in the next uh, weeks and maybe even longer than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our question for this week is, If Jesus has a God, how can he be God? That doesn't make sense. There's only one God, and Jesus, according to the Bible, in many places, has a God. For instance, the verses that Preston referenced in Ephesians 1.3, or in 1 Peter 1.3, or where Jesus himself said, after his resurrection from the dead, in John chapter 20, verse 17, Go to my brothers, he called the apostles his brothers, go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. Or in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, this is the glorified, raised, now at the right hand of God, Jesus. In the book of Revelation, he's called the firstborn from the dead the faithful witness in Revelation 1, verse 5, and then in chapter 1, verse 6, Jesus is the one who has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. Now, if you're a Trinitarian, that doesn't make sense. You have Jesus Christ himself saying that he has a God. How could that be if he is God? 